When people today think about computers, they generally think about these electronic machines that we use to do our work and our spreadsheets, but also do things like surf the internet and, well, play video games. And while the term computers have stuck, of course, devices today do much more than just compute mathematical calculations. But before the cathode ray tube and electronics changed the world, there were computers. Mechanical computers used gears and rotors to calculate complex functions without the need for electricity. And one of the most interesting was a machine that did some of the most complex calculations on Earth for a very important purpose for the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey that was affectionately called the Old Brass Brains. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Mechanical computers have a long history. Perhaps the most famous is the Antikythera mechanism, an ancient Greek hand-powered orrery that was designed to predict astronomical positions, eclipses, and even the timing of various Greek games. Discovered among wreckage from an ancient shipwreck in 1901, it is by far the oldest example of a machine meant to compute mathematical concepts by the use of gears. While the device implies the existence of other similar machines, none have been found. A thousand years later, Chinese polymath Su Song designed a hydromechanical astronomical clock tower, which was completed in 1094 and used mechanical elements such as the endless power transmitting chain drive. In 1206, Muslim polymath Al Jazari designed the castle clock, considered the earliest programmable analog computer. Throughout the Middle Ages and into the modern era, numerous other mechanical computers were built such as Giovanni de Dondi's Astrarium, which tracked calendar days as well as tracking the moon, sun, and planets. In 1642, Blase Pascal developed an arithmetic machine which could add and subtract, and in 1672, Gottfried Leibniz developed a mechanical calculator that could also multiply and divide. Charles Babbage, sometimes called the father of the computer, designed multiple mechanical computers, including the Stepped Reckoner in 1833, which could calculate polynomials, and the Analytical Engine in 1837, which would have used programmable punch cards and even contained a kind of memory. Babbage was unable to actually finish his designs, but they represented important steps in the development of mechanical computers. Humans have long been interested in predicting the tides. On Earth, tides are affected by multiple factors, including the gravitational influence of the sun and moon, as well as the force of the Earth rotating. There is evidence that various civilizations recognize the influence of the moon on tides, but before computers, the only way to predict tides was through experience, by rule of thumb. Copernicus and the heliocentric model revolutionized theory about tides, and various scientists such as Francis Bacon, Galileo, Kepler, and Descartes proposed theories, but it was... Isaac Newton, who formulated the most advanced tidal theory based on his theory of gravity in his Principia in 1687. Newton described the tidal force and was correct, but not complete. Did not take into account bathymetry or the effect of continents on tidal patterns. In 1775, Pierre Simon Laplace, a French polymath, conceived of the more complex system that is his dynamic theory of tides. The place formulated a set of linear partial differential equations, which substantially improved the prediction of tides. While the equations remain important in tide prediction, they were still approximate. Further developments of harmonic analysis by William Thomson, beginning in the 1860s, helped to explain how local circumstances affect tides. The math involved to accurately predict tides, however, is incredibly complex and time-consuming. In a specific location's tide prediction needed a sample of local tidal observations, which represent the basic factors that affect tide, including gravitational influence of the sun and moon, and the complex bathymetry of the ocean floor, and the topography of the coastline. Each of these factors are referred to as constituents. By the late 19th century, clockwork and mechanical concepts were considerably more advanced, and in 1886, James Thompson developed the ball and disc integrator with his brother William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, used to build the harmonic analyzer. The harmonic analyzer used a series of mechanical systems to solve the complex math equations necessary to predict tides using harmonic analysis. Kelvin designed his tide predicting machine in 1872 and exhibited at the British Association meeting in 1873. His first machine could compute eight tidal components, with the second machine computing ten by 1876. Each component was represented by wheels on the machine, which are set to represent local conditions before calculation. In 1879, a larger version was made for the government of India, which computed 20 tidal components, which was enlarged to compute 24 in 1881. British Tide Predictor No. 2, as it became known, was used to predict tides in India before being used by other ports as well. 
It was transferred to the National Physical Laboratory in London in 1903. Kelvin's machine and tide predictor number two delivered their predictions with a pin plot of tidal height against time. As the mechanism was turned, a pen would draw the tidal height along a moving band of paper. They could produce a year's worth of tidal predictions for a particular port in about four hours. In the United States, a machine that worked somewhat differently was built. In 1880, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey employee and tide researcher William Farrell suggested to the superintendent of the Coast and Geodetic Survey that a machine could be used to predict the maximum and minimum tide heights and provided details of how the machine could be constructed. The machine itself was constructed by Foth and Company of Washington, D.C. and put into service in 1883. In the meantime, Farrell resigned from the Geodetic Survey to take a job with the Signal Corps but continued to oversee the machine's construction. According to the survey's 1883 report, the working capacity of the machine is estimated to be at least that of 20 computers by hand. Unlike Lord Kelvin's machine, it didn't draw the heights visually, but displayed the minimum and maximums for a given time on a series of dials that were then tabulated by an operator. Heights in between high and low tide were only known indirectly. Tide predictor machine number one revolutionized the creation of tide tables by the U.S. CGS, and the survey soon relied upon it heavily. By 1895, the machine had been in almost constant use for 12 years, and as a consequence, it seen significant wear. The survey decided that a new machine should be constructed, which would be sturdier, along with other improvements. To build it, they turned to Ernest Fisher, who worked in the survey's instrument shop and had worked for Foth & Company during the construction of the first machine. Dr. Roland Harris, a tidal researcher with the survey, worked with Fisher on the design. Work began in 1895 when initial designs were accepted, but work was slow. According to Fisher, only such time as could be spared from the regular and more pressing work of the instrument shop could be utilized, and that a reduction in force meant that work was suspended entirely for three years. The machine would also be more sophisticated than the feral machine. This included indicating not just high and low tides, but the height of the tide at any instant. Like the feral machine, it would display the tide information numerically for copying, but like the earlier British machine, it would also produce a tidal curve on a roll of paper. It would also provide for 37 tidal components in its calculations. It even had a special device which could be switched to account for leap years. While the machine was mechanical, it did have several electric components. Battery-powered circuits marked hours and days on the paper graph, and a battery-powered magnet stopped the machine at high and low tides so the operator could copy it down. The machine did its calculations when the operator manually used a hand crank. Work on the machine was finally completed in 1910. The computer came to be known by the various nicknames, but most prominently, Old Brass Brains, although it was also called Old Brass Bolts and the Great Mechanical Wizard, among other things. Old Brass Brains is 10.8 feet long, 6.2 feet tall, and 2 feet wide. It has more than 15,000 components and weighs 2,500 pounds. Old Brass Brains had a series of wheels, which, like the earlier Kelvin machine, are manually set to represent tidal constituents, which represent different aspects of the sun, moon, and earth system which impact the tide. It was first tested using two particularly complex ports tides, Aden, Arabia, and Hong Kong, China. They allowed the machine to calculate most of the year's worth of tides before comparing its readings to the most careful and accurate human calculation and found errors of only two hundredths of a foot for Aden and six hundredths of a foot for Hong Kong. Tide predictor machine number one was retired in 1911 when number two was first used to predict tide values for 1912 and 13. The machine was then entirely disassembled, polished, plated, and lacquered, and then reassembled to make the tide tables for 1914. To make the calculations, actual observations of various factors are recorded and put into the machine. These include any factors that affect tides, like gravitational influence from the sun and moon, the depth of the bay, offshore islands, and many more. It took several hours to configure the machine, and it took between 8 to 15 hours to produce a year's prediction for tides. In 1925, a geodetic survey employee reported that to accomplish the same work without the machine would require the labor of more than 60 skilled computers. Another report said that the predictor turns out in from 10 to 15 hours the work that would keep a mere human calculator busy for six months. By 1915, the machine produced tide tables for 70 major ports worldwide, and with an auxiliary table provided tidal information on 3,000 other places. Ten years later, the list was 81 principal ports and 3,500 subsidiary ports. The machine was a marvel of the time and significantly improved the reporting of tide tables. According to a 1925 report by the New York Times, within two years, the toll of life and property taken by ocean wrecks has been virtually halved.
thanks to the Coast Survey's marvelous instrument. The mechanical prophet with the brass brain had, the newspaper claimed, tamed the tides. Colonel Lester Jones, superintendent of the Coast and Geodetic Survey, pointed out the enormous saving to the government the machine provided. In an article in Scientific American lauded the unique engine and the accuracy of which depend millions of dollars and thousands of lives. The survey produced hundreds of pages of tide tables each year for the use of all who go down to the sea in ship. The safety of the captain's ship and the lives of all on the vessel may depend on that information being accurate and reliable, the article continued. In 1927, the machine even disposed of a popular myth regarding Paul Revere. According to the legend, Revere was able to ride longer thanks to the tide which delayed the British from marching. British troops landed at East Cambridge at around 11 p.m. on April 18, 1775, where they waited for several hours. East Cambridge was essentially an island at the time, and at high tide, the causeway connecting it to the mainland was underwater. Using old brass brains, the survey found that low tide on April 18, 1775, was at 7.50, and high tide at 2 a.m. That meant that it was nearly high tide when the British actually crossed, bringing into question the entire story. The British likely delayed waiting for supplies and not waiting for the tide. During World War II, tide prediction was vitally important, especially for the many amphibious landings conducted around the world. The exact time that soldiers landed at D-Day, actually at low tide because the Germans had built obstacles that would have made landing at high tide more difficult, was determined in part by tide machines, although the work was done mostly by UK machines and not old brass brains. Fear, however, that the machine would be targets for sabotage led the survey to print annual tables for major ports four years in advance. The survey also created special restricted tables from 1940 for islands and locations where American troops might need to land. This included tables for Punta Gorda, Venezuela, the Gilbert, Marshall, Caroline, and Mariana Islands, the Western Aleutians, Curl Island, Japan, and the Philippines, among others. These reports were important parts of invasion planning, especially in the Pacific Theater. The survey also published tide and light diagrams, which in addition to tidal data included daylight, stages of twilight, moonrise and moonset, and the brightness of the moon, each published for a particular month at a particular location. More than 1,150 diagrams were published for 112 locations during the war. Old brass brains remained in service after World War II, providing tables for ports all around the world in countless volumes and booklets. In 1959, the survey even published small craft chart series targeted at yachtsmen. In 1960, the hand crank of old brass brains was replaced with a motor and a system installed that could automatically print readouts of high and low tides. Tide predicting machine number two was finally retired in 1965 when an electronic computer replaced it. Today, tide tables are produced digitally by the successor to the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Electronic computers, sometimes massive supercomputers, can integrate far more components than their mechanical forebearers, sometimes integrating as many as 100 into their tide calculations. But for 55 years, old brass brains did it all without ever needing to be, to be plugged in. By any standard, it is an astounding feat of engineering whose product saved countless lives, billions of dollars solve problems that had plagued mariners since ancient times. Today, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration maintains old brass brains in working condition in recognition of its historical value and importance. For more stories from NOAA's history, visit noaa.gov heritage. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.